But I'm really delighted that you took the time to talk to me, Niall, I this just evening. Want to, sorry about the, the mix up on the time and all that. No, not, but, uh, not at all. There's so many things I could ask you about. I had a hard time kind of narrowing things down, but I, I think I've hit on a couple of kind of key questions that will interest people who read my blog. Um, it's more of a visual and cultural blog and a bio biographical blog, Niall, as I explained sure. to you. So um, we, when you're ready, we can launch in. I, I'm all set. Go okay. right ahead. So obviously I want to ask you about your early years, Niall. You grew up in in Tipperary. Indeed, my brother-in-law, Michael Quinn, remembers your dad quite vividly, Donal, um, and, and uh, often mentions him when your name comes up. So I suppose I wondered a question, how does, how your first memories that come back to you about those formative years, but also what Tipperary perhaps means to you as an Irish American? Is it something that you think about in terms of your identity now that you've lived away for so long? I, I'm interested in regionality and things like that. So I, I thought I'd begin with that. Sure. No, um, I'll tell you where it's most important to me. It's a tip hurling team. Yes. Um, I was brought up in Turles, as you know, and hurling was in my blood from a very early age. I know I left Turles when I was 10, but I was deeply indoctrinated at that point into the, the great Tipperary teams of the early 1960s and Jimmy Dial and John Dial, Tony Wall and all those, Liam Devaney. I think I could probably name the team. And something that really kind of grabbed me at the time, like a young kid fixates on a particular sport. Mm -hmm. So what Tipperary means to me is I get as excited about Tipperary playing in a hurling all Ireland as I would about any team playing right. anywhere so that's amazing that's the one memory that I and the one sort of connection mm -hmm. that I've kept all my life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well that's a very strong one and one that a lot of people uh, from Tipperary would uh, identify with so you moved then with your family when you were about 10 I think to Drogheda and you completed your primary and secondary education there before moving on to UCD Nile. um yeah. so I, I'll go to UCD because a, I'm, it was English and history you chose as your subjects well am I right in that uh, actually, English and Irish. Uh, English and history. Irish? Okay. Yeah. Um, um, with a view, perhaps, to becoming a teacher. Yeah, you know, it was a time, you're talking about the 70s, where you didn't have any great ambition other than a certain level of what, what did your father do? My father was a teacher all his life, so I basically wanted to become a teacher. You didn't think back then of any great sort of career changing mm -hmm. moves, but you tended to go along with the flow, which was teachers' sons tended to become teachers. Yes. The legal business was controlled by certain families. The yeah. medical business was controlled by certain doctors. I think to some extent it's still the same. Mm -hmm. but you, you didn't have any great horizon other than what your father had done and what your family history was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I, can, I can fully understand that. And during that time, you did go on a trip to America, which was probably something a lot of students may not have had the opportunity to do at that stage. So that was formative for you to go on a working, was it a working visa when you were in college? Yes, I, I was always fascinated by America. I had a, you know, I love, my father loved cowboy and Indian movies and the old movies. And, and I remember going to see John Wayne and all that stuff and just, growing up with the kind of mythology of America. And then I remember very specifically John F. Kennedy coming to Ireland. Mm -hmm. and what an inspirational figure. It seemed that overnight the country went from black and white to color. Mm -hmm. Because you had this spectacular young president who, you know, a very backward country like Ireland at the time could lay claim to. And it was something very, very thrilling. So America was like in my imagination. Mm -hmm. I often think about that these days, what the kids today when they see Trump, what they think, uh, as against what we saw, you know, which was a great American president called John F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. So I went to America in 1976 for the first time. I was in college in UCD and I went to Chicago for the summer to play football, actually, Gaelic football. I was a reasonably good footballer and hurler, I must say, but uh, mainly played football with um, the Connemara Gales and hurling with the Limerick hurling team. So that was a great way because I had no relatives in America as such. Uh, and it was a great way to get started. I think one thing about the GEA that people forget is just how much socialization and goodwill there is when you arrive into a new town and you don't mm -hmm. know anyone. You can go to the GEA club, you can get to know people. In my case, they got me a job, they got me a place to live. 
and I made an immediate group of friends and uh, mm -hmm. I just found America everything I was looking for as a young man. Um, and, and of course you had a strong sense immediately there then of community and, 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 a, and an Irish American community even at that stage seems to have been something that really nurtured you in your first trip there. Nurture is a good word because I, you know, I can't imagine what I would have done if I didn't have the GEA, if I didn't have that immediate connection with people to give me a job and get me started because it's a pretty intimidating country otherwise. And uh, I found it very, very helpful to be able to hang out with a group of people right from the beginning. Yes. And it was just a great experience because, you know, geographically everything at that age, my mind was expanding to what was I going to do after college and all that. And I remember thinking, you know, this is a magnificent country. I really enjoy myself here. I love the, I love the climate. It was still, you know, although I wasn't crazy about the heat at the height of summer, but I love the people. I love the whole sense of adventure, basically. Mm -hmm. mm. Like so many Irish before me and since. Yes. yes, yes, indeed. It's such an incredible history and an incredible bond. And so you came back then to Ireland, thought for a while, was this vision, did, you know, did you, you, you were going to, you moved back again to California then a couple of years after, had you a vision, Niall, as to what you were going to do then? Was, was, was the, the world of journalism beckoning to you or was that something that came about again when you got to California? Or could you tell me a little bit about that, please? Well, it's interesting, you know, I, I often talk to young journalism students and people like that and I always say, don't plan your life because it won't work out as you expect anyway. <laughs> And I kind of went, I never sort of said in my head, well, I'm leaving Ireland and I'm never coming back. I just went to America in 1978. I went to California, which was a fabulous uh, experience for a young Irishman at the time. Again, using the, uh, the Gaelic football and hurling connection, I played out there with teams and, you know, got in with a crowd of lads. And uh, I remember at the end of the summer thinking, you know, I'm not really that interested in school teaching. I'd like to really see if I could do something out here. Not making a complete decision, but just saying, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay for a year. I'm going to stay for two years. And suddenly it's 40 years and you look around yeah. and think, how, uh, did that, how, how did that happen? I know, I know. But you launched the first successful newspaper in 50 years when you, you know, when you had settled a little bit in California, the Irish man newspaper. You so, you were beginning yeah. to see a need to reach out to the Irish Americans, Niall. I think that was yeah, that something. It was just at the time, it was right at the time that uh, immigration was becoming an issue from Ireland again. And the early 80s saw a flood of young Irish come into California, New York, Boston, Chicago. And what I remember noticing, because I was working in construction myself and a friend from Connemara started a small construction business, but just how little knowledge people had about Ireland and the new Ireland and what was happening. Because there was no internet, obviously. There was very little uh, media that you could get from Ireland. Uh, occasionally, there would be an Irish radio show on, tele on radio, but that was about it. So I thought, you know, because there were so many young Irish coming in, that this was an opportunity for me to start a newspaper because I was always very interested in writing. And I had, I had written for a local paper in Drogheda for a couple of years. So I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to give this a shot. And with the sheer madness of youth and the sheer irresponsibility, just starting a newspaper with $1,200 when I think of it now and making it work was just, um, just a great growing experience and something that told me a lot about myself and also a lot about America. And the main thing about America was the goodwill that people had towards you if you were Irish was phenomenal. Mm. And when we started the newspaper, the amount of support we got and very good people. I remember after a week we went broke and I had to go and ask this guy for a loan. And he, not only did he give me a loan, but he got five other people to help. And it was it was that kind of initial stage mm. where you were all in it together. You were an immigrant community. Mm. You helped people and it was all informal. But I look back on it with great pride and great sense of achievement that you know, 90, 95% of new publications never get off the ground, but we did. Yeah, fantastic. And in deciding to move to the East Coast, you had obviously at this stage found your vocation, found a passion in translating as such what was happening 
back in Ireland to the community in the States. That, that, that would have appeared from what you've just said as one of your objectives, Niall. And that's what you wanted to do when you got, or, or, or was it more to liaise and bring together the Irish community in America? Probably a bit of both. Well, there were two levels to it. One was that the Irish American history, not just the Irish born, but the Irish American history was so incredibly fascinating. Like in a place like San Francisco, where the, the Irish had come in their droves for the, for the gold rush in the 1840s and they had, you know, put together much of the downtown infrastructure. He went downtown and the streets were called after Irish people. And there was this whole history, mm. extraordinary history of the Irish in California that I became very, very interested in. And that was one part of it. And the other part of it was the young Irish coming in who didn't have any access to information other than through my paper. Right. But I realized that I wanted to do was start a magazine. I had been to New York a couple of times and just in terms of the numbers of young Irish, there were far more in New York. Also, I remember always going by a newsstand one day and picking up an Italian American magazine called Attenzione and thinking, you know, something like this could work for the Irish. And mm -hmm. that was the determination for the um, Irish American magazine. Irish American magazine. And uh, another Tipperary person, Patricia Harty, was working on that as well. Mm -hmm. So we decided that New York and Irish American magazine was really going to be the the uh, the future. And um, again, I went off. The rest is my, history. <laughs> rest, the rest is history, good or bad. <laughs> but I mean, I when I came to New York again, it was like starting all over. Mm. Uh, um, and somebody said to me, instead of going west, young man, I went east. Mm. But it was, um, again, a great welcome, a great sense of involvement by the community, and what, uh, people understanding and being proud of what I was trying to do, which was create a whole new Irish sensibility out of the fact that so many new young Irish were coming in mm -hmm. and they were changing the whole situation there. So Irish America was mainly aimed at the Irish Americans, the history, the heritage, and you know, the, like John F. Kennedy was obviously Irish American, but mm. there were so many other great figures in American history who were Irish American. Mm -hmm. And writing a, a magazine for them, for the 40 million people of Irish extraction, mm -hmm. was a great task. And then wow. in 1987, that was 1985, 1987, starting the Irish Voice, Voice, because there was a massive influx of young Irish into New York at the time. Mm. And something I was thinking about when I am, um, and indeed the Irish Voice was the first successful newspaper since 1928, I think, Niall. So again, and, and a huge yeah. circulation. So, I mean, what an achievement. Um, fantastic. But what I was thinking about, I'm jumping ahead a little and I'll go back in a minute. But something that struck me when I was thinking about that, and I suppose this is inevitably after uh, Trump's time in office as well, but when we see, when I look at social media in Ireland and when I, when, I, when I think about politics in the States, I see this incredible polarized society. I see the Democrats on one side, the Republicans on the other, and the Democrats are progressive economically, pro-immigration, pro-choice, pro-same-sex marriage. And you could say almost directly the opposite, Republicans, Republicans are conservative, anti-immigration, anti-choice, things like this. I mean, is it as bad as that there or not? I mean, I think the election really brought that home to me. I, I used to have to close uh, social media some days because I would see these pejorative terms being thrown by Republicans at Democrats, calling them communists and um, socialists. And I, it just, I wonder, did you find a problem in reaching out to the Irish American community in bridging that divide? Or is it that pronounced among the Irish American community now? Well, the Irish American community reflects America at large, and there is definitely, I mean, I, I think of it this way. If you look at the Irish American political history, we had the great liberal Kennedy family, the great liberal uh, icons of the, the 20th century. You had, um, you know, on the other side, Joe McCarthy, who was also Irish American, who was a rapidly anti-communist, rapidly right wing. So you had this differentiation. Then you had Eugene McCarthy, who was a very liberal American senator who played a huge role in um, forcing uh, Johnson, President Johnson, out of office. So you had this divide right through, which reflected to some extent the greater American culture, but also the level of, of people's experience. I mean, 
in terms of like the liberal Irish, like they made huge contributions to the United States. I mean, I think John F. Kennedy was probably the key figure in terms of the Irish Americans, but there were thousands of other politicians across the country who created the Democratic Party, really. The Democratic Party arose out of Tammany Hall fundamentally and the rules and regulations of Tammany Hall about how to get elected in local politics and how to take care of the local individual, how to go block by block. And that was all from Irish American political experience. Mm -hmm. And when you look at how uh, Roosevelt handled the depression, a tremendous amount of the donations and charitable and then the kind of work programs and all that that was done were based on Irish models. Mm -hmm. So I think from that point of view, there was a very identifiable Irish strain in our, in American politics. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, you had Ronald Reagan and people like that of Irish American heritage who saw mm -hmm. very differently. Mm -hmm. And you know, in fairness, it didn't look that bad during the Reagan era, really, when you think back on it now. Yes. With, with Trump, it's just become completely and disastrously divided to yeah. the point where, you know, there was a story today in the New York Times that 71% of Republicans don't look on Democrats as their opponents, they look on them as their enemies. Mm. And that's a sad day for politics. And it is. Totally, yeah. Totally yeah. great by, by the Trump era. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very, very sad to see it having, um, I suppose, regressed so far, Niall. That's probably the best word to use in that context, you know. But anyway, we have we have good days ahead and we have a different administration. So well, I, Yeah, and I, and, I, and I want to put that in context. I mean, I, I was on 125th Street in Harlem in 2008 when Barack Obama, a black man, was elected president. Mm -hmm. I never thought I'd see that in America yeah. or anywhere, actually. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at the result from the Senate race, two Senate races in Florida and uh, Georgia, you had a Jewish guy and a black guy elected in the Deep South. I mean, there's a lot of tremendous amount of change going on in American politics. And yes. it's not all about Trump. It's yeah. about states like Arizona, states like... Georgia understanding suddenly that you know the Republicans are gone completely off the wall and there's more and more people like Colorado used to be a red state now it's a blue state so I think there is an underground political movement of a shift to the left which is probably disguised at the moment because everyone's talking about Trump mm -hmm. but long term, I think that that is I mean if you look at the last uh, election since 1998 I think the Republicans have only won the popular vote one time so they're not necessarily as, as popular or as dominant as people might think. Yes, yes. And again, it's what we're being fed and how, how the media can present some of these things. It, get, it can become skewed when you're not on the ground in a certain place, you know, however, however yes. vast the American uh, society is. And, yes. Um, OK, so I'll bring you back a little bit, Niall, and I'll come back to Biden in a few minutes now because I'm conscious of time as well with you and I don't want to delay you too long. But obviously, Niall, you played such a pivotal role in uh, in the, the, the progress that was made between the American administration and relations with Northern Ireland in the lead up to the Good Friday Agreement. Um, now, that was largely through your friendship and your collaborations with Bill Clinton and his time in office when you acted as a key negotiator there. So the question that, that came to my mind about that, Niall, and it is bringing you back a couple of years now to ask you this, but when you were over in Tipperary in 2000, you know, we had seen the establishment of the Good Friday Agreement and you were concerned at that stage about the Patton Report because that was clearly still um, a worry at the time as to whether the British administration were taking the policing side of things seriously enough in Northern Ireland. Now, happily, that all seems to have panned out OK with the establishment of the Northern Irish Policing Board. But it, I wondered, and I'm, I'm, look, I'm jumping over time spaces here, but in light of what happened on the 25th of May 2020, Niall, with George Floyd's tragic death. I wonder, have you ever thought about something like that working, you know, because you were knowledgeable about that particular process in the Northern Irish context? Do you think right. a reform of policing might happen under this new administration in light of the upset that that man's death created? You know, I wish I could say yes, but I, I actually think what I've become acutely aware of, something I should have known for a long time, but I never really thought enough about it, but the depth of racism in America 
is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And that's the very sad part of it. And that's what's blocking a lot of progress in an awful lot of places because, you know, it's almost so prevalent that you don't notice it. I know that sounds strange, but the mm. entire society is set up in such a way because of slavery that black Americans are second class in terms of like the number of people dying from COVID, in terms of general health issues, in terms of employment, in terms of all these factors. And there's a very good question to be asked, why is that the case? And I think a tremendous amount of it is, I, I'm not even sure people mean to be racist, but it's like they inherited this society where blacks were taught of as second class and third class people. And that flows over into policing. I mean, mm. the secret to policing, as everyone knows, is that the policeman at the top of the road in the Ardine Road should be uh, a Catholic policeman because he understands the community and he's, he, he's from them and he's understood by them and he's uh, accepted. Now, in America, unfortunately, the chances are in most of these black neighborhoods that the policeman is a white guy. Mm -hmm. And like what happened with George Floyd, where you had this thug of a policeman who was uh, mm -hmm. put his foot on his neck for nine minutes. And mm -hmm. for the life of me, to this day, I cannot understand why he did that for yeah. any reason. I mean, it made absolutely no sense other than to torture the poor man, who was obviously not well to begin with. No, and to assert his authority, of course, and his power in, in, in the dynamic. Yeah, but it's one thing to kind of, but to spend nine minutes killing yeah. somebody. No, uh, oh, it was horrific. I couldn't watch it, to be honest. I, I found no, it too distressing. It, it, mm. it really made me think an awful lot. And I think that's where Black Lives Matter came in very mm. promptly. And I, I, you know what I'm delighted about more than anything? Mm, yeah. You know, people, people attack the young generation that they're into their computers and they're into this and Facebook and all that. But they came out in the streets in mm -hmm. huge numbers. Mm -hmm. Massive. Absolutely. When that happened. Yes. And that is something very healthy in a democracy that people can protest peacefully and make the point over and over this is not good enough. Mm. And I was very proud of the fact that so many young people did that because yes. they really had a bad reputation as a generation that wouldn't go outside the door other than to uh, socialize mm. or mm. Mm. Yes. exchange sex or whatever. So I think from that point of view, there, there is a lot of good things happening at, at a younger level. But if mm. you ask what's really going on in America, unfortunately, I think racism is so deeply ingrained that it's very, very hard to deal with it. Mm. And even after Obama's presidency, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to believe that these things could be happening to the, to the extent that they are. But from what you're saying, it is deeply ingrained and it's not going to resolve easily. It would take a, a really a complete um, re-envisaging. Re you look at the faces of the mob that stormed Capitol Hill. Just look at the hate. Mm. Look, yeah. Look at the yeah. look. Look at the horrible, horrible things they did. They mm. gouged out a guy's eye. Mm. They killed somebody. They threw a fire extinguisher at someone else. Mm -hmm. They attacked somebody with an American flag. Mm. I mean, these are bad people. Mm. And mm. and you know what Trump did quite deliberately is wake up that slumbering giant of racism. And promote it and push it for his own reasons mm -hmm. to ensure his re-election mm -hmm. and it was a dreadful political thing to do and it was a dreadful outcome that happened mm. but i think people now finally see that that's what trump was doing and I, I do believe that what's happened to the republican party is very tragic because they're a party that apparently does not believe in democracy uh, mm. And you can't survive as a party like that because they're not accepting the results of the election. They try to overturn it. To this day, there's 44 senators who don't want Trump to be tried on the issue of creating the, an insurrection, which there's no doubt he did. So they're in a very bad, very bad way, in my opinion. But it's also an incredibly fascinating time because America's going through incredible transformations. Like what I, when I say... Trump is bad, but then I really do say that electing a black man in Georgia, electing a, a Jewish guy in Georgia, that's huge. Yes. People would yeah. never have thought of it 15 yes. years ago in the, yes. heart, in the heart of the South that a black guy and a Jewish guy would get elected to the Senate. Yeah, well, that's very positive, and that's something we, you know, it's, it's, I'm delighted to hear you say that. And I say, I guess we don't hear enough of those stories as well filtering through. And I mean, again, that's, that's probably, 
uh, you know, we're hearing more of the negative side than some of that progress yeah, well, we've just been. More likely to talk about riots and all that, but mm. even the election of Obama, I know it's two steps forward and three steps back, but yeah, it was an yeah. incredible thing to do. Yes. And unfortunately, Hillary missed out very narrowly. That would have been yeah, very unfortunate. Yes. So yeah. I think the country, in many ways, is mm. innovative, creative, uh, finding new ways, finding new people. Mm. But unfortunately, the last four years, mm. frankly, I, I'm serious about this, Denise. A lot of people I know, myself included, seriously wondered if we could live through another four years of Trump. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can understand years, that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It would have effectively become a dictatorship. Yes, no yeah, doubt. very scary, very, very scary. And in light of all that you achieved, and I know we won't go into this in too much detail because it's too vast a topic, but in everything that you did and worked for in the context of Northern Ireland, Brexit was also a big blow in that respect, Niall. And, you know, it did appear like it was a dark place, the world, for a few years, and then COVID on top of it. You know, I mean, <laughs> all I can say is <laughs> at, at, at least, at least, at least, Biden made it in. And I loved your piece in the Irish Times um, where you talked about um, Robert Frost's advice to John F. Kennedy, you know, about how to direct his presidency, you know, be more mm -hmm. Irish than Harvard. And I, I thought that was brilliant. And you made the point that Biden is even in some respects more Irish than John F. Kennedy um, in some respects. Do you, do you see him having a, a hugely positive role for Irish Americans and for and for Ireland. I mean, he clearly is a person that with his administration, he has selected people across ethnic grounds, across gender grounds. I was delighted to see, obviously, the vice president, Kamala Harris, is wonderful. And his um, interior secretary is an is a Native American Indian, uh, right. Deb yeah. Hayland. Now, that hasn't probably been confirmed yet. And of course, we have Samantha Power, an Irish lady, my own age. Uh, who will be shoring up U.S. aid? I, I think so. I mean, these yeah. are great things to see happening. Do, do you do you see him as being very important for the Irish now, Niall? I see him as being very important for the world, um, mm. and also the Irish. I think it's very interesting when you get inside the American mindset. They go and they pick an African American president, then they go and pick this crazy lunatic, you know, television reality star. Mm -hmm. But then they go as far away from him as they can and they pick this calm, very together, very easygoing on the surface, mm -hmm. conciliatory figure, which is what he is. You watch what Joe Biden's doing. He hasn't said a single thing against Republicans in any kind of inflammatory way. He said, mm -hmm. I'm trying to deal with them, but he's just taking down the whole tone. He's letting all this other stuff go over his head. He's getting the COVID package together. He's getting the economic package together. He's doing exactly what Joe Biden does. He's a legislator. He's a mm. guy, and this is what people don't understand. To move the levers of power within the US government, you have to have such an intimate knowledge, which is exactly why he picked people who had been in the cabinets before, because mm. Trump hadn't a clue no. how to how to use the, the, the levers of power, like even in terms of delivery of the vaccine. He just said, leave it to the states, which was an insane thing to say. And tens of thousands of people died as a result. But I think Biden knows, it's like a guy who's been a cop for 50 years and suddenly he becomes the, the captain. He knows what he's, he knows what he's doing. Mm. And this guy knows exactly what he's doing. And I'm very, I'm very proud of him because, I mean, if you look at a guy who came from nothing, I mean, he's, his grandfather, great-great-grandfather left on an emigrant famine ship from uh, Cooley County Laos and, and the other one from Mayo. And three generations later, there he is in the White House. And mm. Uh, mm. I think he's very, very aware of his heritage. And I think already in terms of Brexit, where he stepped in and said, no, you're not going to mess around with the Irish on this one. We, we want the position that's in the Good mm. Friday Agreement. Mm. So I think from that point of view, he's very, very keen. I mean, I know the guy reasonably well. I first interviewed him in 1987. And the reason I interviewed him was he had written an, uh, an article about Wolf Tone, how he and was you, his yeah. political hero. So and you subsequently I, wrote a book about Wolf Tone, yes, did you? Yes, right. you did. Yes, yeah. So, I mean, he basically, he's exactly what you need in terms of calming down the country, which is what the country desperately needs. Yes. So I think from that point of view, he's going to be very successful. Yeah, I hope so. And I agree with you fully on that. 
And I suppose I'm going to, I won't go on much longer, Niall, because it, to transcribe the blog, I think to keep things <laughs> condensed, it's always better to capture your audience in that. And we've covered such a vast territory there already. My last right. question would relate again to, I think you've kind of answered it. Have you, have you, have you thoughts of returning home? You still have family here. I know you probably would be on, on the plane already if uh, Trump was back in office, but uh, <laughs> you, may, you may be reconsidering that. Well, you know, I, I went home for the Kennedy School uh, September 12 months ago, and I haven't been, I, I just haven't been home since. I mean, it's been extraordinary to go a year without being home. And uh, mm. it's really upsetting, actually, because you miss so much with your family. And, but also there's a hunger within you just to see Ireland. Yeah. I know it, it, the exile situation is really one that emotionally, Every so often, I need to go back and connect with Ireland. Mm. I need to talk to people. I need to find out what's happening. I need mm. to hear it firsthand. I need to look at the, the country and see where it's at. But I also just love to be there and mm. to meet family and friends and all that. And of mm. course, that's all been cut off, not just for me, but for everyone. Yes. So it'll be a great day for me when COVID is finally yeah. vanquished and I'm able to get on the EI 105 mm. and land into Dublin Airport. Because, mm. you know, in in... in in so many ways it's still home my family is there mm. and um, it's something that I miss desperately I mean even the hurling and the football and all that the atmosphere around those months is so exciting mm. and it was all very different last year it worked out in the end but mm. you know you missed the games in the summer which were great mm -hmm. Mm. Even even I did, and I'm 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 probably the least knowledgeable person about uh, anything in this in that arena, as, as one could imagine. But uh, I fully I fully understand what you're saying. Well, I want to thank you, Niall. I know I've it's thank a, it's a, it's a cross section of questions.